Well, I just want to have an overview of the field. The field is gigantic and it's really impossible to, in 45 minutes or however much I run over, and we can run over fortunately a little bit because of our uh, video problem, but we have the room into the evening and for all of you diehards, cold fusion diehards who want to stay and, and listen. But we, we really should establish some principles here to begin the day. And I think these are the two concepts that we really have to get in mind, which seems to have been overlooked by the dominant uh, scientific culture. Uh, and that is, you cannot <coughs> use theory to reject experimental evidence, uh, no matter how strong the belief in that theory. That is the, at the root of what is wrong with the uh, perception by the establishment of cold fusion. They have theories that suggest that this cannot happen. And this blinds them, they have paradigm paralysis one might say, to the possibility that there are other things going on there that they don't understand, that we collectively don't understand. And I find this re actually rather remarkable because we have today, as you all know, large mysteries that are widely touted in the media, such as the fact that the age of the universe appears now to be shorter than the age of the oldest stars. Kind of a problem, I would say. And they admit, finally, even the New York Times admits it. Uh, it actually seems to me, and I will make a prediction today, uh, I think I will be proved correct. I don't know exactly in what form I will be proved correct, but I suspect that the missing mass problem of the universe, which is behind that issue of uh, the age of the stars and the uh, uh, <coughs> age of the universe problem, uh, will be explained in part due to what comes out of the cold fusion field. I, I, really, I can't prove that, of course, but I believe the joke will be on the physics establishment and they will rush with open arms to us once they realize that our little piece of experimental work uh, fits their, their problem uh, to a T. Another, another myth is that extraordinary claims um, require extraordinary proof. That's not true, despite Carl Sagan's uh, aphorism. And I li like Carl a lot. I think he's gone astray a little recently on, a, on the matter of cold fusion. He was positive uh, or open-minded for a while and recently he made a speech saying it would not have any value. But we don't need extraordinary proof. We just need proof. And we have proof, okay? Any mechanical engineer who can measure temperature, who can measure, uh, uh, use dynamometers to measure mechanical power going into a rotary device. Uh, people who know how to measure tritium because it's used as biological tracers and so forth. The evidence is overwhelming. Now, for some of you new here, it might not be overwhelming and please understand where I'm coming from. I'm not here to tell you and give you a tutorial necessarily of why you should believe in cold fusion. Uh, I'm not, that's not my job. I do believe that we have a major scientific discovery and a major technical revolution going on. It's your business, for those of you who may be neutral to highly skeptical, to read the evidence, and it's in our flyers and so forth, and other companies that have got their information here, to look into it. But we will present an awful lot of material today that I hope will lead to uh, uh, persuading you if you are on the line. The main focus of the day will be scientific findings technological developments, and commercialization. All these things are, by the way, proceeding in parallel now. Uh, there are those who are much more interested in the science, and that's fine. We need those people to work in a dedicated way in the laboratory to reveal the mechanism of this fantastic mystery that we have. But in a parallel way, much as uh, Ira Magaziner predicted at the first congressional hearings on cold fusion in 89. He said, we've got to go in parallel with technological development. And he was absolutely right. Now it's definitely true because we will have, I predict, technological developments, home heating units, electric power generators, what have you, probably before we understand fully what's behind the science. Of course, commercialization is going on too because there are many here, such as Eneco and hydrodynamics and uh, uh, clean, clean energy uh, technologies from Dallas who so graciously came up and uh, Polytech Corporation. 
These people are hard at work to produce products, get patent positions, and so forth, in parallel with the actual experiments and what have you. There are other issues, however, and I, and I do not mean to gloss over these. I just want to make a, a kind of a demarcation between what we're going to talk about during the day and what we will talk about this evening for those diehards who after supper perhaps will come back. We have permission to go from about 7 to 8.30 in this room and have like a panel discussion concerning uh, these issues, which are government policy toward coal fusion, congressional and executive actions that should have been taken or may still be taken in the future, research funding at national laboratories and universities, national security, a very big issue, not only from the possible military applications of this technology, uh, definite in my view, but also the very serious matter of our economic security vis-a-vis -vis intense efforts now underway in Japan with an infrastructure far more open to this technology than in the United States. As to military, by the way, the field is producing regular, low-level, but significant amounts of tritium. I need not remind an audience like this that tritium is an ingredient in thermonuclear weapons. And it's also being produced currently by a very inefficient and absurd way, namely a, a breeder reactor type approach at Savannah River, which I don't know whether is open or not, but they plan to spend billions of dollars to reinitiate our tritium production for nuclear weapons because tritium, you know, has a 12 and a half year half-life and we have to keep restoring it. Of course, we don't need that many nuclear weapons anymore, thankfully, but nonetheless, we have to worry about the Qaddafis and the uh, Ayatollahs of this world knowing how to make, and they do know how to make tritium now because it's in the open literature of cold fusion and it's not classified. The economic impact we've talked about, gigantic potential geopolitical consequences, the environmental impact which thankfully will be extremely beneficial. This is the best discovery for the environment in my view ever. Social issues which will have come from all of that. Taxation, we now tax gasoline. Who's going to pay for the roads when we have free energy and we don't have to pump gasoline or nearly free energy? I shouldn't, always, shouldn't say free energy. Science education. Right now in the United States, coal fusion obviously isn't being taught. Okay, it doesn't exist in virtually all physics classes, chemistry classes. There's going to be a huge lag. We have an outstanding counterexample to that today in a way of, the, of uh, Ray Conley from MIT who is doing experiments in the Department of Astronautics and he has some excellent results to, rep to report later. Also, the process of science is something we could talk about this evening. What do we know about the process or what have we learned about the process of science as a result of all of this hubbub that has occurred since 1989? Media coverage of scientific controversies, an outstanding example of which we had yesterday and uh, uh, which I was happy about, by the way, even with, with, with all the negative uh, aspects apart, and research ethics in reporting scientific results and the general decorum of science, you know, uh, being polite to one another within reason, 